formative years, I attended public schools in the state of Tennessee. One week in seventh grade, a woman came to our class to educate us about sex. Now, this involved things such as her telling us how bad sexually transmitted diseases were, but it also had her having us do activities such as taking a piece of tape and sticking it to every single person in the classroom, so that by the end of the activity, the tape was dirty and no longer wanted. A metaphor for us if we ever had sex with more than one person. It wasn't until high school that one of my friends finally learned how to properly put on a condom, the first time she ever had sex with her boyfriend and he had to show her. And the funny thing was, the only reason he knew how to put on a condom was because he had learned from a previous girlfriend. These stories just kind of illustrate how lacking medically accurate comprehensive sex ed is, especially in the state of Tennessee. Today, we're going to be examining some worrying numbers relating to this lack of sex ed current Tennessee laws, and a couple of steps that we as a society can take to help combat these issues. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, out of the 50 states in America, only 24 require that sex ed be taught in public schools. And even less than this, only 20 states require that the information taught in sex ed classes be medically accurate. Now, and what really comes in here is that each state is allowed to decide for themselves the definition of medically accurate, which can allow it to be skewed some. In a 2013 report by Huffington Post, one group, Decisions, Choices, and Options, which is responsible for much of the sex education in Nashville area high schools, will often take information and present it out of context in order to implement scare tactics. They'll tell students things such as, every STD will leave a woman infertile, something that's not necessarily true. Or they'll make outlandish claims such as saying that having sex with more than eight people is the medical equivalent of drinking the spit of everyone in a classroom. Again, something that's not true. The reason they do these kinds of scare tactics is to further promote Tennessee's abstinence-only policy. And Tennessee isn't the only state that furthers abstinence among anything else. But what we see when we compare these abstinence-only states to other states is that the results leave something to be desired. According to a 2015 Center for Disease Control report, um, Tennessee's rates for chlamydia and gonorrhea amongst young people are actually much higher than the national average. And in a U.S. Department of Health and Human Services report from 2014, on a scale from 1 to 51, accounting for the District of Columbia, with 1 being the highest rate of teen pregnancy and 51 being the lowest, Tennessee was ranked 13th. This disparity is due to the lack of comprehensive sex education available in Tennessee. And the sex education being comprehensive is what's key here. Because according to a University of Washington study, comprehensive sex education can actually lower the teen pregnancy rate in any one area by as much as 50%. But Tennessee laws not only don't call for this and promote abstinence only, but it actually actively discourages any kind of discussion or education in the classroom. In 2012, Governor Bill Haslam signed into law what is colloquially known as the Gateway Sexual Activity. What this law does is it prohibits any teachers or educators from either condoning or even discussing anything that can be considered a gateway sexual activity. And a lot of controversy that surrounds this law comes from the fact that the wording is so vague that it can include things such as just kissing or holding hands. Now, that we've seen how horrible the laws in Tennessee are relating to sex education and what the results of this lack of sex education are, we can look at a couple of things that we can do to help combat these issues through one of the most powerful tools that we have available to each and every one of us, knowledge. First, we have to take it upon ourselves to better educate ourselves in issues relating to sex and sex education. So that way, we can not only be safe, but when the opportunity arises, we can help others be safe by passing on our knowledge. I first started educating myself in relation to sex and topics when I was 13, the age when my best friend first became sexually active. Through educating myself, I was able to help her overcome her fears about what was happening to her and her body, so that she's able to stay safe and go on to have a more sexually healthy, active lifestyle. But something that we specifically in this room can also do is that we can sign a petition that I have taken the liberty of setting up online. 
that calls for Tennessee to implement comprehensive sex education in the classrooms, as well as it calls on Tennessee legislature to review and remove Governor Bill Haslam's sexual and gateway sexual activity bill. It's through actions such as these that we can help see a decrease in the teen rates of STDs and pregnancy. Because we are no longer at a time where we can pretend that teenagers are not having sex. In a 2015 CDC study, at least 44% of high schoolers had engaged in sexual activity. Through actions such as these, we can help ensure a brighter, more educated, and healthier future for our youth.